over overexposure to antibiotics early in life would tend to have an adverse effect on the assembly of the microbiome known about brain gut for a long time because mm. we use it in our in our daily language we say you know i'm sick with fright very good evidence now that that creates a risk of the later development of obesity there are long lasting effects uh, and the same is true of the microbiome you can't suddenly just say oh, well, when the child gets to be three years of age, we'll, we'll fix the problem. I'm afraid it doesn't work that way. The damage is done at that stage. Well, the same is true of the microbiome. If you disturb that early on, it creates a risk factor for the later development of disease. Certainly not as overweight as, as what uh, current generation. And we're also seeing it now in children, which is a bit uh, hor horrifying, actually, is one of the things that creates unhealthy aging. And in fact, accelerates aging. The relationship between the microbiome and mental health. Professor Shanahan, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate this. And I'm looking forward to our conversation. You're welcome. Glad to speak to you. What is the microbiome and, and, and why is it of so much significance in terms of human health? Well, the microbiome, that word simply means the collection of creatures living in and on the human body. Uh, so it's a, just a collective term. Uh, sometimes it's used interchangeably with another word called microbiota. Mm. It doesn't really matter. Microbiome, strictly speaking, refers to all of the genetic information that's within all of those microbes, bacteria, yeast, viruses, that are living in and on the human body. But the word is just generally means all of those microbes, just a collective term. Um, what is the gut brain axis? And, and, and can you describe that anatomically? Yeah. Well, the gut brain axis has been around a long time. It's one of the best examples or best understood examples of the mind body connection. The brain is connected to the, to to the rest of the body uh, in order for us to, to survive. Because if, for example, you have an infection or a thorn or a nail or something wrong with your big toe, the most remote part of your body, the brain has to hear about it. It has to know about that if it's going to respond. It tells you, well, take your toe out of the hot water or do something about it. Uh, or in other words, it has to sense, it has to receive information and send signals back to tell the big toe what to do. Mm. The same is the case with the with organs that you can't see, such as the gastrointestinal tract, which is just that tube from your mouth all the way to the anus. It's a big, long tube, which in actual fact in humans is greater than an Olympic long jump. The Olympic record was once around 29 feet. So the small intestine alone can be as long as 29 feet. Now imagine trying to uh, pass all of the material that you consume during a day, all of the food, all the saliva, all the liquids you consume, and orderly passage that down the gastrointestinal tract and extract nutrients from it. That's a big complex operation. Mm. So, and it has to be accomplished without us being aware of it. We might hear the odd gurgle. We might know when we feel hungry. We know when we want to pass a bowel movement, but we otherwise we're not conscious of that. That's all accomplished by information being fed back to the brain and the brain adjusting the the motility, the movement of the the and the transit of the material in the gut. So it's a remarkable accomplishment. Now, similar things are happening in your lung, in other organs of the body. The brain is continually receiving information and doing something about it. Uh, so you asked about the anatomical structures. Well, the way in which the brain is connected to the gut, the gastrointestinal tract, is mainly by nerves. And the mm -hmm. most famous one, the most obvious one, is a thing called the vagus nerve. Vagus is, is Latin for basically wandering. It wanders all around the gastrointestinal tract. It, it, it uh, uh, extends all the way from from the esophagus all the way down to the to the further parts of the of the gut and there are other ner nerves as well mm. so that's one way and the traffic by the way in the nerves is both from the brain to the gut 
and from the gut to the brain. In fact, in the vagus, 80% of the nerves are actually from gut to brain rather than the other way around. So it's really a highway for the brain to find out and to sample and to know what's going on in your gut. Um, it also receives information from local hormones um, and from um, what are called metabolites, chemicals produced in your gut as a result of you eating food. So breakdown of food products, some of those go towards nutrition, but some of them go to signal the brain. And the brain then sends back signals either along the nerves or in the bloodstream, and they're called hormones. So it's, a, it's an act of communication, but it's not exclusive to the gut. It's just part of a greater mind-body connection. There's no other way in which a, a complex, humans are so complex, a lot of moving parts. Uh, we couldn't function unless there was a lot of coordination happening beneath the level of consciousness. And we're only beginning to really understand all of that now. But humans have known about brain gut for a long time because mm. we use it in our, in our daily language. We say, you know, I'm sick with fright. Mm. And that would become nauseated with fright. We say, uh, I mean, not to be too rude, but people say I'm scared shitless. People mm. can get diarrhea. They can get bowel cramps when they can mm. become very anxious. Um, so we, we use those words in daily parlance, but they do actually reflect the fact that our brain is hearing about our uh, what's going on in our gut. Um, in your the book, um, Listen to Your Microbes, there's a line in the description, and you say, when we are born, we are basically sterile. By the time we die, we are more microbe than human. Yeah. Could you, could you expand on that? So humans are called homo sapiens, um, just to give the the scientific term for human. Hmm. But actually, the human body uh, has as many microbial cells as it has human cells. Now, when a fetus is, is conceived and in utero, in the, in the mother's uterus, it is effectively sterile. It does receive, it does get exposed to breakdown products of bacteria from the mother's gut and from, from her skin and from her other organs. But it's not being exposed to live bacteria. Otherwise, it would get infected and couldn't survive. So it is receiving microbial information, if you will, but it is otherwise sterile. But the moment we uh, are born, we're colonized inst instantly. Organisms, our first organisms we receive, the first wave of colonizers are from the uh, microbes that are in the mother's birth canal in her vagina. Uh, and the second wave then would be from her skin and from the immediate surroundings. If a baby is born by cesarean section, it's plucked out of a sterile environment in the uterus. And the microbes that will first colonize that baby will generally be from the mother's skin. Um, so th that's the distinction between the two roots of birth. And that has an influence on the early microbiome of infants. But we also do receive microbes from the father, from... Uh, everything that surrounds us and that assembly of the microbiome. And in other words, that collection of organisms that will colonize us going forward into adulthood, that assembly is accomplished pretty much in the first three years of life. So there's a lot of things happening in that first three years of life that are critical. Now, other things are happening too. You know, when a human baby is born, it's completely defenseless. It can't it really interact with its environment. It's taking up signals, visual cues, auditory cues, touch cues. It has to learn all that. The brain has to learn all these this information about the environment. Well, the same is true of the immune system. And the brain is also learning about the microbial environment. So that's more about the brain gut, the mind-body connection and the brain gut good signaling. It's happening from the respiratory tract and from the skin as well, sending signals to the to the to the brain, sending signals to our immune system, which learns how to cope with the environment, not by waiting for the occasional infection that would come along. That's not how it gets educated. It gets mm -hmm. educated by learning what's harmless. So the immune system first has to find out, well, 
what do I not need to react to? I don't need to be reacting to all these microbes that are on the skin and, and in, the, in the gut. Um, they're harmless. I need to react to something I haven't seen before that might be dangerous. That's what the immune system is doing and the brain is doing as well. So anything that would disrupt that, such as over overexposure to antibiotics early in life would tend to have an adverse effect on the assembly of the microbiome, which in turn will affect the education of the immune system. And we're now learning that um, that is a risk factor for the later development of things like allergies and certain autoimmune conditions. And it's not surprising. Uh, the immune system is just a sensory organ. It's, it has to learn about what's in the environment. Well, the same is true. If you, if you disrupt vision or hearing early in life, well, and then restore it later on, if one were to able to do an experiment like that in humans, and, and it happens naturally with certain diseases. But when you restore those senses later on, they don't necessarily function as perfectly as if they were intact from the moment of birth. Well, the same is true of the microbiome. If you disturb that early on, it creates a risk factor for the later development of disease. So we're saying those those first three years are critical in the formation of the microbiome yes. um, environment. And the dis how you would disrupt that would be with antibiotics. Um, and if an environment... That would be the most common. That would be the most common form of disruption. Another one would be malnutrition. The microbes mm. have to be fed as well as the human cells. So profound malnutrition, uh, in hopefully not in the first world, but certainly happening in the third world, um, profound malnutrition early in life, obviously it has a direct nutritional effect on the brain, on the immune system, but it also deprives the microbes. And it's like a double whammy. It's a double effect of, of, um, of malnutrition on the welfare of the, of the growing child. And, and, and Fergus, can, can we cor measure and correct later in life? Um, unfortunately, it's it's actually almost a state of emergency in childhood. If you or I go through a period, if we as we have, if we as adults go through a period of malnutrition, we can correct that without much loss. But if it happens at the critical stage when the brain, the immune system, and all the internal or, internal organs which are present at birth but they're not mature, if you get a hit at that stage, I'm afraid there are long lasting effects. Uh, and the same is true of the microbiome. You can't suddenly just say, oh, well, well, the child gets to be three years of age, we'll we'll fix the problem. I'm afraid it doesn't work that way. The damage is done at that stage. So it, it is it is a, quite an urgent thing to restore nutrition as quick as possible to young children when it's when it's when they are malnourished. So we're talking about malnutrition and we're talking about antibiotics. Anything else? Um, oh, one could dream up of anything that might adversely affect the gut. Mm. More subtle things. They're, they're extreme examples I've given you. And I, I wouldn't want to say that antibiotics should never be taken in childhood. There are times when you have to take them. Um, and it's really about excessive antibiotics for a long period of time. That's where the risk factor arises. The odd course of an antibiotic does a limited amount of damage that we can recover from. It's mm. more about profound and prolonged antibiotic exposure. But another example would be um, the preterm baby. You know, the preterm baby is born, well, let, let's compare it with the full-term baby. Full-term baby is born with uh, all of the organs developed but not mature. I mentioned about the the immune system. It has to get educated before it fully functions. But at least it's present when at birth in 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 after a normal birth the preterm baby is different the preterm baby first of all even the lining of the gastrointestinal tract isn't fully intact we call that the mucosal barrier it's just a general lay term for it but that's not fully intact and the immune system is not fully intact and the blood brain barrier is not fully intact so at birth where the normal infant is colonized with the average microbes that are present in any in, in its environment, which are a, an asset, a benefit to that baby. But in a preterm baby who's ill-equipped to deal with anything in the environment, they're a potential threat. 
they're a threat and may cause infection. So any organism, this is why I don't like the term good microbes and bad microbes or friendly microbes or unfriendly microbes. Any microbe in the wrong place at the wrong time is a threat. Microbes in the right place at the right time are a total health asset. So the preterm baby is another area where their microbiome is disturbed because their immune system is not fully developed and because their they, their gut is not fully developed and fully matured. There are lesser impediments. Does um well does the quality of of feeding, you know, breast milk is probably the best functional food there is on the planet. Breast milk is ideally adapted. Human breast milk is ideally adapted uh, to service the needs of a newborn baby, and it tends to do it in several ways. It has a, a wide variety of factors, but in addition to nutritional content, it also has some microbes, but the nutritional content tends to favor and retain the most beneficial microbes that can be there for a newborn baby. So if you compare the microbiome of a newborn baby, even though it starts its microbiome by acquiring the microbes from its mother, the composition, if you were to compare the two, they're quite different. The newborn baby needs a lot of what are called bifidobacteria. Bifido just means bifid. They're just Y-shaped bacteria when you look at them in the microscope. But those bacteria are perfect for a newborn baby in terms of helping the maturation of their different organs. And uh, the majority would be in a newborn baby would be bifidobacteria at the early stage of, of life be quite different in the adult mother. The mother might only have one to two percent of those. And 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 that's a benefit of the of the breast milk. It's 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 actually retaining it's the perfect milk for those particular organisms. Now it doesn't mean if you're not breastfed that you're at a complete disadvantage. You can, you know, there are other ways that you can compensate for, for it. But it does mean that if there's if there's yet an additional hit, if you're preterm and you're also born by cesarean section, and you're also not breastfed, and let's say something else happens that you need a lot of antibiotics, which might happen in a preterm baby, that's several hits happening to the developing microbiome uh, that would put that that baby at, at considerable risk. Um, and if the, but if the baby matures, gets makes it through to infancy, um, when you when you say considerable risk, what are the long term risk factors then? As they, as the baby be uh, for for a mother who has say a ten year old boy or a girl, what could she do? What intervention could she make? Well, I've mentioned the, some of these extreme examples, but let's let's just tone it back to say, born normally, normal full term delivery, nothing, not preterm, and perhaps needs a few courses of an antibiotic, or for for, for whatever reason, take an antibiotic a few times at say the first six months of life. Now, as I said, if it's needed, it's needed. And I would never say that antibiotics have been marvelous for mankind. They've made all kinds of things possible. The damage happens if antibiotics are taken inappropriately, like just because you have a runny nose. What child doesn't have that? Mm. Or you hear people taking antibiotics for colds and, and flus. They're viruses. Antibiotics don't work for that. Antibiotics only work for for bacterial infections. So misuse of antibiotics. What what are the, are the risks later on? I mentioned allergies and I mentioned autoimmune diseases. There's very good evidence now that that creates a risk of the later development of obesity. Now we're seeing tremendous rises in obesity that we can't simply account for uh, by just um, the obesogenic food. Weight. Yeah, we we can, we blame it on. You know, car on carbonated drinks, people drinking too much uh, colas and eating big lots of popcorn at the cinema and eating fatty food. That's of course a contributor, but and we certainly have an obesogenic environment in the sense that everything colludes to making us eat a bit more than we need. But if you've got a microbiome that uh, has been damaged in some way. That means that you're extracting far more calories from using that microbiome than would otherwise happen. Then you're at an added risk. And all of the things 
that our risk factors that we talk about for obesity are the same things that actually are not good for your microbiome. And uh, while we can't do, for ethical reasons, we can't recreate those situations in, in humans, but experiments in animals have certainly shown that exposure to antibiotics, particularly in the first years of life, damage the microbiome to such a degree that it's not always recoverable and that certainly makes the animals prone to obesity. So uh, obesity is probably the single most important risk that we expose ourselves to if we're consuming antibiotics inappropriately in childhood. Um, in terms of microbiome um, and disease, is there, is there a, a cancer link? Is there a okay. serious disease link? Well, if you don't mind, before I answer the question about the microbiome and disease, what I like to point out is that the evidence that the microbiome is there to promote health mm. is far more impressive than the evidence that it may occasionally cause disease. Mm. So I, 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 we, we definitely need to need to remind ourselves of that because. Mm. Without a microbiome, we don't cope well in the world at all. We're very it's the vulnerable. microbes, as I said, educate the immune system. Mm. They educate your metabolic health. They educate your brain and your nervous system. Without them, we wouldn't be healthy at all. So that's the, 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 the more robust statement. Now let's come to disease. The most obvious example of, a micro, of the microbiome contributing to, you mentioned cancer, would be uh, stomach cancer. So there's one particular organism, Helicobacter pylori, that is known to cause ulcers in some, but not all people. And it's also known to cause stomach cancer in some, but not all people. Um, and it's clear cut now that that's been proven. That's not just an association. That is a cause, an example of a cause and effect relationship. That would be a very good example of a single organism linked to cancer. However, only a minority of cancers could we say that they could be traceable to a specific organism in a cause and effect relationship. We do suspect that um, colon cancer, which is very much influenced by diet and by lifestyle, we've known that for a long time. Now, there is a small component that's due to genetics, family history. But the majority of sporadic, in other words, uh, colon cancer that occurs at random in the population, the majority of that is in some way related to the environment or to lifestyle, particularly diet and lack of exercise. So the risk factors for colon cancer are, in fact, obesity, uh, Western type diets, high in meat and high in fat, low in fiber, and um, reduced exercise is associated with that. They're all the things that are actually not favorable for a healthy microbiome as well. So we have been able to show that we're not the only ones in Cork in Ireland in, in the APC that have shown that there are certain microbiome signatures that are associated with colon cancer. We even were able to show that uh, certain microbiome signatures tend to increase your risk of having polyps. These are benign tumors they're not cancer, but they have a high risk of developing into cancer. So that means that um, uh, the microbiome might be a biomarker. In other words, something that we might be able to predict who might be at greater risk of colon cancer in the population so that we could channel our resources. They Probably they are the people that need to be screened more aggressively than people who are taking a healthy diet, who aren't obese who don't have any other particular risk factor for colon cancer. But we don't know the specific organisms that are causing that, that risk. We know that this collection is not going to be like stomach cancer, where it was helicobacter, one, one microbe, one disease. In the case of colon cancer, it seems to be consortia. When I say microbial signatures, I mean patterns of different types of microbes. Remember, we, we all have We've got billions of microbes in our gut, and we probably got at least a thousand different strains, so that 
it's not one strain causing the disease. It's probably combinations that have caused that. But we can do something about it. And the simplest thing we can do about that are things we've known about all along. Exercise, avoidance of obesity, and high-fiber diets do make a difference. Um, so uh, there has been talk in the media that Ireland may be the most obese country in Europe. I don't know if you've heard of, of, of the latest research. I can't think quite where it came from, but I have seen articles in the newspaper, which which is kind of alarming. Um, it, is, it, is it related to our diet, our Western diet? And could you point it, is it a Mediterranean diet that would be an improved diet, an Eastern diet? I'm thinking of Japanese. Like, where would we look to for better dietary uh, behavior, if you like? Yeah. Uh, well, if we're not top of the, of the league table in terms of obesity and being overweight, we're certainly up there. It doesn't really matter. Are we first, second, third, or fourth? We're, we're, we're up there. Mm. And... We also know that from looking at previous generations. Uh, so there, there isn't much doubt about it. You can look at older people, look at older generations, and they're certainly not as overweight as, as what uh, current generation. And we're also seeing it now in children, which is a bit uh, hor horrifying, actually, to think that the children are already on a path to obesity. Once was a time when you'd never see a child over, or rarely see a child overweight. Now it's quite commonplace. Mm. and um, I, I trained in medicine, so I, I, I ran a clinic for patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And these are the patients who struggle to absorb nutrients in diet. And yet, by the time I came to the end of my career in clinical medicine, two thirds of my patients were overweight or obese. The very people who actually, in previous generations, we would actually be finding ways to give them nutrition. So overnutrition is, is a big factor. So before I get into different diets, the first thing I'd say that the conversation should always begin with dose, the amount. You know, just about any diet can be compatible with health Portion so long size. as we don't eat too much of it. Yeah. So that always has to be a, a factor. But there, there's no doubt in my mind that um, diet has also changed in the last several decades and certainly since World War II. And it's part of the obesogenic environment, if you like. It's so easy to get convenience foods. It's so easy to get energy-dense foods. Once was a time when we were eating real food that needed a lot of chewing and a lot of workout and very little glucose hit, sugar hit to the bloodstream. Now we're getting an instant hit from energy-dense foods, which, you know, they have a role. I would completely be in it, be totally against them. But um, on the bigger picture, you're asking, why the Irish? Well, it, it just could be that, remember, uh, we're only, what, 150 or so years or a bit longer since the famine. Um, so the current population are basically a few generations, several generations away from the famine. The people who survived the famine might have been people who had a microbiome that was adapted. Robust. To be yeah to maximally to extract maximum amount of calories from the available food, mm. and and even before the famine they were living on a kind of a an oatmeal gruel, and they weren't eating uh, high fat and lots of meat, so they probably had a microbiome that was fit for that non obesogenic environment, extract maximum calories to do the best you could with whatever you were you were you were consuming. Now transform someone with that kind of microbiome into the modern environment. So it could be someone who's a migrant from, and this is relevant to, to, to how we treat our migrants. Let's say you've got a migrant coming from a war-torn torn country in Africa with only episodic availability of food, lots of famine, and you bring them to Ireland and they're now in our environment and they're eating our food because it's all that's available then that microbiome, which was once an asset for them, could become a liability because it's extracting far more calories from, from the same amount of food that we'd be exposed to. So, you know, that could have been a contributor and partly why the Irish in particular seem to have disproportionate degrees of obesity. They're certainly in an obesogenic environment, but they might have had a microbiome that was yeah, developed Redacted. in a much earlier time. Yeah. And it, yeah, I, so it, it, then it would have um, 
it would have been adapted that adaptive to the environment so correct so we do we do see kind of what we do see is if you if you we've some in, inkling that some of this is probably true mm. if you compare microbiomes around the world and this is a criticism of microbiome science that most of the work done on the microbiome in humans has been conducted in wealthy affluent countries mm. ireland england uh, the rest of europe north america very little conducted in third world countries and um but some work has been done and we know mm. that when you go to those countries such as in certain areas where they're latter day hunter gatherers um uh, or parts of africa the south south asian subcontinent um you find microbiomes in humans that are compatible with health in that environment, but very, very different than the microbiome that you or I would have. Mm. And uh, and by that, I mean their microbiomes tend to, we call them non-industrialized microbiomes. Now, I use the word non-industrialized in a strict sense. It's defined by the United Nations. You know, so there's a, there's a set criteria for that. But if you look at microbiomes, for people in those countries, they're better adapted to fiber diets, high fiber diets. They have very low antibiotic resistance genes because they've been exposed to very little antibiotics in the past. And those microbiomes are not associated with obesity and chronic inflammatory disease. If you now look at the microbiome that we see in Ireland and North America, they're all actually all rather similar to each other, but dissimilar from the non-industrialized microbiome. The kind of microbiome you find in Ireland is actually not very well adapted to high fiber. In fact, it's more adapted to eating the mucin, the mucus, the protein that lines our gut. So it eats ourselves if it's not fed fiber. It is associated with a lot of antibiotic resistance genes. And it is a microbiome that is quite well associated with metabolic diseases, obesity, autoimmune diseases, and allergies. Now, where a problem arises is when you move people around the globe, and we live in an era of mass migrations. And as I said, you move someone who's not used to a, an obesogenic environment and you put them into our environment, just because we can't see the damage that's happening to their microbiome, we will see it in 10 years' time. We will see it at a late, later time, and we will see it in the children uh, of those migrants that uh, we need to take into account how we should be feeding their microbiomes. Now, you mentioned Mediterranean diet. If I had to pick one, I would say, yes, Mediterranean diet is probably um, the single, it's the one diet that does fit the bill to try and ensure you'd have the most favorable microbiome to offset some of the diseases I was talking about. But again, everything in moderation. It's not. We're not talking about consuming vast amount of olive oil or vast amounts of anything you can't over consume and expect to stay to stay to stay thin so the dose the consumption amounts are important uh, you mentioned some migrants coming to ireland that could have an adverse effect but would the reverse be true so irish people going to environments where they have a um a, a, a different a completely different dietary um menu if you like it would, would be quite, very good for Irish people. Quite pro well, quite probably what the predominant migration is from non-industrialized to industrialized mm. rather than the other way around. And there hasn't been much research on, on the other way around. But we do know that while the microbiome does change and it changes within the first year of someone migrating, those studies have been done. When you come from a non-industrialized background to an industrialized country, you get this westernization, this modernization of the microbiome and it begins within the first year so that does happen and it may most of that's probably due to diet but there probably are other factors that we don't know about yet but we also know uh, and have known long before we knew much about the microbiome that as sure as night follows day the people who move from those countries which have a very low rate of obesity and a very low rate of allergies and in immune disorders and metabolic disorders, those people, when they migrate, they do develop the diseases of the new world. We know that for sure. And I feel we owe it to them 
to actually not wait for it to happen, but to intervene in some sort of way, because we know it will happen. Mm. Um, what's the uh, is, is there a relationship between the microbiome and mental health? I'm thinking in terms of stress. Um, is there much research in that area? There's a lot of research. Not enough, I probably would say, but there's a lot of research in relation to the microbiome and mental health, but with what huge caveat, most of it has been performed in animal models, very little in humans. Now, so you're, the reason to believe rats. it might have a role yeah. is that we do know the microbiome is critical for brain development. We know mm. that. Mm. Um, uh, but that does not mean that it's critical for ongoing mental health. It doesn't mean that you can suddenly take a microbial transplantation and hope to sort out your depression. I would be very slow to overstate some of the research. I would just simply say there are grounds to believe that the microbiome has a role. But whether that has been overstated is unclear yet. And I would call for more research. I wouldn't want people to think that they can eat their way out of depression or whatever might be the mental health issue. Um, I wouldn't. I think it's too important to trivialize in that way. It, it, it has a sensationalist kind of ring to it. And while there's some good science that supports some of that, mainly in animal models, the evidence in humans is much less. And remember, an experimental animal is not the same as a human. It's in captivity in the first place. It's highly stressed because it's in captivity. It doesn't have the coping skills that a human has. They're usually inbred animals, whereas the human is a very outbred animal with lots of different genetic influences and coping skills. And the animal is in no control over its environment, whereas humans are, in, to some degree, we are in some control. So I don't think the research in animals can be easily extrapolated to humans. Uh, so it's just a word of caution about overreading that. Um, how does aging impact the microbiome? I think we, we touched on it earlier, um, and it, you touched on it in the description for the book. Um, but can you describe what's happening as we, we say we get into our 50s and 60s and get older? And can is there any um, interventions we can make um, sure. to improve things? Yeah, well, you know, aging, we tend to think of the elderly, and that's not a word that the elderly like, by the way, but we tend to think of it, it's it's, it's uh, artificially described as after the age of 65 in our culture. In other cultures, it might be regarded as further, further on. Mm. But actually, aging is happening much earlier. You know, look at our athletes. Soccer players don't go on for much more than their 30s. Some rugby props could go a bit longer, but aging is happening, you know, in the late adolescence years and in the in the in the um, early uh, early twenties and thirties. Um, our bones are aging, you know, certainly from an earlier age. Our cartilage is aging, and you can see changes and deterioration much earlier than the fifties or the sixties. So. We should all know that we're all aging. Just look at the elite athlete who, who uh, you know, is losing muscle power, muscle bulk, or the golfer who might be only in his forties, but after each few years goes by, he's not getting the same distance on on his driving. So, you know, aging is is, and we know from bone densitometry that there's lots of muscle mass, lots of bone mass, from quite early early on. So we shouldn't just think, oh, well, that's something I'll worry about when I get to be 65 or 55 or whatever. With the microbiome, again, it's something you can't see, but we can measure it. We know that certainly from the 50s onward, but you can see subtle changes even earlier on, that there's a progressive deterioration. And by that, I mean, we actually lose microbes. You know, I said that, uh, you know, we come into this life sterile, sterile. and by the time we leave it, we're fully colonized with all these microbes. That, that is true. But we are actually losing microbes um, as we get older. So that, for example, when you see someone in their 80s, frequently their nose is practically sterile. They've lost a lot of microbes from there. 
unfortunately, the rate of deterioration is not uniform in the different microbes. We tend to lose microbes that are more beneficial for health than we do for some of the other microbes. So, for example, the clearest evidence and demonstration of that is if an older person, if you or I, if you take an antibiotic, you might or might not get some diarrhea because it disturbs your microbiome, but you get over it, you're fine. But if an elderly person takes an antibiotic, they're at particular risk. They have an increased risk of diarrhea, an increased risk of developing colitis, inflammation of their colon. And that is due to overgrowth of an organism called Clostridium difficile, or Clostridium difficile, as some people call it. C. diff, it's sometimes called. That's an organism that most of us have in our bowel. And for the vast majority of us, it doesn't do much. It's not, it doesn't overgrow. It's not, it's not causing much problem. It probably even gives us some health benefits that we don't understand. But if you take an antibiotic and disturb all the surrounding microbiome, that organism is very hardy. That's why it's called difficile. It's tough, it's hardy, and has a potential to overgrow. And when it overgrows, when there's an imbalance created by the antibiotic, then you get into life-threatening situations. Now, you don't see that in younger people. You tend to see that primarily in older people. So there's an example where the older person is starting off with a very much reduced microbiome, a very much shrunken microbiome, not very diverse. So it doesn't have much resilience to cope with either infections or if something gets out of hand, if the Clostridium difficile starts to overgrow a bit because of the antibiotic, which wouldn't cause a problem in you or me, mm -hmm. then they're at risk of that condition. So the microbiome is shrinking and becoming less diverse as we get older. Is there something we can do about it? Absolutely, there's something we can do about it. It's one of the few things we can do to influence uh, age, the aging process, because an un unhealthy microbiome is one of the things that creates unhealthy aging and in fact accelerates aging. And that has been shown in huge big studies now. The data on that, and they're in humans, not just animals, the data on that are very robust. So what could you do? The simplest thing you can do is diversify your diet. So what happens when older people, um, the worst situation is when they get particularly old living alone, so that they're not interacting with other humans, they're mm. not getting out in nature, so they're not being exposed to the wider microbiome. They may no longer have a pet, or if they're in an old folks' home, they're not allowed to have a, an animal pet in the home, so they're not touching and picking up microbes from the animals. They tend to collapse their diet. They tend to go for more convenient foods, usually very milk-based, tapioca-type things. They mightn't have the dentition to chew very well. So mm -hmm. dentition is terribly important in them. So they do what's easy. And they take a diet that traditionally the dietitians would have said, yeah, that's fine. There's plenty of calories and they've got vitamins in it and it's got all the conventional nutrients. But it lacks one thing, diversity. So, you know, a study was done in Cork some years ago that was published in Nature, which is the top scientific journal. And it showed that when people, elderly people, collapsed their microbiome because they've collapsed their diet, they have an increased rate of frailty. They tend to have thinner bones, less muscle mass, greater potential for falls. And that's, that's what we'd call frailty. And it could be measured objectively. And that was linked to increased inflammation measured by inflammatory mediators biochemically, and that in turn was linked to the microbiome. After that study was done, one of the editors of the Guardian newspaper said, the guys in Cork have actually sent a clear message. Um, and they said, diversity, variety is not just the spice of life, it's staple. In other words, dietitians, it's no longer acceptable to assess your diet just on the basis of, are you getting enough calories and are you getting enough nutrients? You also have to factor in, are you getting the right kind of nutrients that feed your microbiome? And the best way to do that is to diversify your diet. A little bit of everything, but not to just restrict it to have a monotonous diet. Now, all of that has been reproduced in animals where you, if you take an animal 
that is in the wild. And if you restrict its diet, give it plenty of calories and nutrients, but let's say you give it a milk-based diet, it's going to shrink its microbiome and it becomes unhealthy, it becomes more prone to inflammation. So the easiest way, diversify the diet, broaden your fiber um, intake, increase it as much as you can. Now, I don't mean drastic amounts, because if you do that, suddenly you'll get cramps and you'll get a lot of gas. You have to gradually do these things, but it will certainly delay the deterioration in your microbiome. And that has been shown in human trials as well. One of my colleagues was involved in a large European-wide study where they fed, they actually gave people free, they gave, brought them the food to their houses, uh, Europeans, and they gave them essentially a Mediterranean diet. And that was shown to, it doesn't reverse frailty, but it delays, the, it reverses the microbiome abnormalities and it delays the downward trajectory of frailty which are, is easy to measure in terms of muscle mass. Now, that's in the elderly. I would suggest to you that athletes or retired athletes or people who want to keep their golf swing going well or women who are concerned about a perimenopausal um, loss of bone mass, which we can measure by, by bone densitometry. I would suggest we could probably do the same. So we, start, need to we need to start thinking about aging long before it's obvious that we're elderly. We need to be doing some something much earlier, decades earlier. And when I think of the Mediterranean diet, the first thing that springs to mind is olive oil. Yeah. And everything is, I mean, everything is soaked in olive oil and olive oil is, you need to really need to develop a taste for it if you're Irish. Well, yeah, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't build it all around that. That, mm. like you, that's the way I, I tend to think of it as well. Mm. But that's, um, that's probably because we're coming from an environment, Ireland, where we don't naturally have olive oil. It, it's not growing, olives aren't growing on our trees or anything like that. If you didn't like olive oil, I wouldn't say it's a big deal. There are lots of other components to the Mediterranean diet. Fish there's, is, is there's a high, big There's thing. fish. Yeah. There's oils in fish. There's plenty of fiber. There's mm. plenty of color in the diet. It doesn't have to be. And, and, and particularly, there's a, there's a lot of diversity of fiber. So it doesn't have to be olive oil based at all. But if most of the elements are there, that's enough. Anyone who doesn't like it doesn't have to take it. I think where, what, what I'm hearing from you, very, very, um, it's very important as we age that our environment doesn't shrink and what we do, we, we don't shrink into ourselves. Correct. Um, and the same would apply for even out, it's related to microbiome, but outside the context of the microbiome, if there was never such a thing as a microbiome, it is good to still retain and you have to work hard on it. Mm -hmm. social connections, people who retire, their social life can change almost immediately because they're not quite the same as their colleagues or things they won't have in common and they can drift away. I think a certain amount of social life, you can overdo it, but I think some energy needs to be inputted to retain that. Connecting with outside, going for walks, being out exposed to nature, being exposed to young people, being exposed to animals, living life as much as varied while getting the benefits of retirement. But it is, it does need, a, it can't be passive. It needs a bit of energy to mm. ensure that's retained. In terms of the, the you mentioned the word social life there, I'm thinking lifestyle. Um, I'm thinking, what do we know about, I, I say alcohol and, and, and sugary, and, and sugar, for example, how it Im impacts the microbiome? Yeah, I, I should say first that, when you mention social life, there is such a thing as the social microbiome. It's actually the things that we were talk talking about with the elderly. Yeah. It's in other words, it's it's acquiring and shaping your microbiome based on the things you touch, the people you meet, the animals you meet, and being out because we we inhale microbes as well. They're it's they're in the air, they're in the water, they're everywhere. Mm. So living life is the way to and living a, a diverse life and rather than shrinking your immediate environment is the, is part of the way to maintain a, a broad microbiome. Now, mm. specifically in relation to alcohol, um, uh, in moderation, alcohol probably doesn't have a profound effect on the microbiome. Um, most alcohol is absorbed very high up in the gut, not down lower in the gut where most of the microbes are. Now, that's not to say I'm, a, I'm promoting promoting alcoholism or anything. It is true that alcoholics, the people who consume excess alcohol, because of the negative impact on other structures, 
um, fat cells, metabolic structures, the liver, they are so those people are associated with an adverse microbiome because excess alcohol con consumption also influences their diet. Think, other things change if they if they drink to excess, but in moderation, it 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 has a limited effect. Th that's not to deny the adverse effects on on uh, when it's taken to excess. Now the sugary drinks are a different matter because they they're largely consumed by young children. There's no fiber practically in any of those. All you're getting is a big glucose hit, which is not natural at all because most of the foods we should be eating, if you're eating whole food, I mean food that would be recognized as food by your grandmother and non-processed food, your, your gut has to do a bit of the digestion. The microbes have to break it down. There's a natural process there. There's a bit of work goes into it and we absorb a certain amount of glucose, sugar. That's all removed if you take a very low fiber diet and you just swamp the system with loads of, of sugar. First of all, you get blooms of microbes that are normally there, but you don't need huge blooms of them. You imbalance the microbiome. You also, because you're taking so much sugar, you're getting early satiety, you're not consuming as much fiber, and you're effectively depriving the beneficial microbes in your microbiome of food. So what does the microbiome have to do then? If it's to survive, it has to find fiber from some other source. And I mentioned earlier, it turns to digesting the mucus that lines the respiratory tract and the gut. Then it thins out the, out the lining of the gut, making you more susceptible to potential infections if the situation arises, if you are exposed to an infection. So for in multiple different mechanisms, a diet that's very high in sugary foods is all wrong for us. It's not natural in the first instance. It's not the way we we uh, evolved. Uh, it's depriving the uh, beneficial microbes of the, the diet it should be receiving. And it's creating this huge glucose burst that is affecting the metabolism and a greater risk for obesity. And that in turn increases your risk of cancer. Because obesity alone is a risk factor for cancer, for a variety of cancers, not just colon cancer, but several several cancers. Obesity of itself adds to your risk. Um, okay, so we, we touched on a few insights and practical tips and strategies to help improve the microbiome. Let me just ask you about two obvious ones that we haven't touched on, probiotics and supplements. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> The big thing I want to say about probiotics, and they can be taken as supplements or they may be in food, but 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 most people know of them. First of all, they're the let's define what a probiotic actually means, because I think this is important. And I've been one who has said that I think the word has outlived its usefulness. Um, but the word is actually there's a uniform agreed definition. It's a live microbe. It could be a bacteria, it could be a yeast. It's a live microbe, which when consumed in adequate amounts, confers a health benefit on the human host. Now there's three elements there. It's gotta be live. If it's not live, it's not a probiotic. And yet you see people marketing them and referring to probiotics when in fact, the container, the organisms are dead or there are spores or something. So th let's get that, that clear. The second thing is it's gotta be taken in adequate amounts. A lot of the studies have never shown the amount that's needed. So they've done no dose response re uh, examinations. Now, not all of them, there are exceptions. And I've been involved in the development of a probiotic where we did all that work. But the third thing is you've got to show a health benefit. The vast majority of what's referred to as probiotics have never had a robust health benefit demonstrated. I mentioned the one we, we produced. We were interested in um, treating an irritable bowel syndrome. So we did clinical trials, robust clinical trials in people with irritable bowel syndrome. There have been robust clinical trials in India to try and reduce the risk and exposure of to various um, infections. There have been robust trials uh, when probiotics are taken with antibiotics that show that certain probiotics can reduce the risk of antibiotic-associated diarrhea and disease. But I'm heavily emphasizing you can't use the word probiotic unless it is actually conforms to the definition and has 
good scientific evidence backing up the claim being made for it. So where, where the field has gone wrong and where the media get it wrong, I could have said to you, look, Connor, asking me about probiotics is like saying, are tablets or pills good for you? You wouldn't say that pills are good for you without knowing what's in the pill and what am I taking for? So if you're taking a blood pressure medication, well, you're taking an antihypertensive in the pill for the blood pressure and there are robust trials to show that that is good for you, that will reduce your risk of stroke. No problem. The same should be required of what is referred to a probiotic. They're not all the same. It could be a different types of yeast, a myriad of different types of bacteria. We have a thousand different strains in our gut. So some of them are suitable to be a probiotic because they can confer a health benefit. Others probably have no benefit. They're neutral. And maybe some might even do harm. But we shouldn't speak about probiotics unless we ask, what's in it? What's it for? So I like to use the precise name of the organism that's in it so that I can find out, well, where is the scientific evidence? And there are several probiotic products on the market where people have gone to the trouble to do from reputable companies to do good studies, good quality control, have the right amount of probiotic in it, uh, live organisms, and they've already done the clinical trial in humans. But doing a trial in an animal or in a mouse or saying this organism made the mouse live younger or made it uh, thinner or made it this, that or the other, that is not a probiotic because you can't extrapolate from mice to humans. The Food and Drug Administration would never accept any drug that was only tested in a mouse. So why should we accept anything mm. less than that? Um, where would I go to find out <coughs> information? Where would would that be on the APC website, or would you have? Could you point people in the direction where, where they want to go to find? Well, because we anticipated the question in the book you mentioned, "Listen to Your Microbes," we do actually address probiotics. But we give it only give it. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm coughing. No, right. you're fine. We only give a small amount of information because we didn't want to bombard pe people with a lot of science. We wanted to portray the majesty and the wonderful nature of the microbiome and the beauty of it. But we have QR codes in the book, so for people like you who are interested or anyone who wants to know, if you take your mobile phone and you flash it on the QR code it will bring you to a website where I conduct an interview that asks the very questions you're asking with an expert requiring far more detail than I've given you. But it will, it's a very good primer and a good start to get to, in, in essence, we cover the point about that not all, micro, not all probiotics are the same. Uh, many of them, many of the things that are called probiotics have actually been justified and has good sense, but you can't assume that one organism is the same as another, one product's the same as another, just like you wouldn't take Mrs. Maloney's, Mrs. Mother's blood pressure tablets. You know, you'd want to know what's in it and why you're taking it. So it's a call for more rigorous and more specific language surrounding the whole area, not to disparage it, but to put it in its rightful place. But that's one source. And those interviews are actually available on the APC, APC Microbiome Ireland website. You can also put on the QR code for the book. Or if you don't want to buy the book, if you go on the YouTube channel, we have a YouTube channel called Listen to Your Microbes. It's about the book, but it is also a repository of those interviews, which cover things like fiber, like the elderly, like antimicrobial resistance, like breastfeeding, um, like Mediterranean diets, non-Mediterranean diets, obesity, cover all the topics that you and I have touched on during during our conversation here. So the information is out there, and the, the importance is listen to the scientists rather than the hyperbole in the media. That's true of everything, of course. Yeah. Um, but the, there is good evidence and the science as well as snake oil. But you'll find the science in those sources. Um, 
what's exciting about what are you excited about when you look at the future of the space, the microbiome space, gastroenterology? What is it AI? What's possible? What what gets you excited when you go into um, the research laboratory every day? Yeah. Um, well, it's always good to look at a little bit of history. And I, I mentioned helicobacter earlier and stomach cancer. Now, when I was a medical student, I used to see stomach cancer all the time in Ireland. And when I, I went away and I, I trained and um, after several, after over a decade, I came back to Ireland and I used to see duodenal ulcers. Uh, my teacher in school used to always be taking milk and he had a, always talking about his ulcer. They were commonplace. James Joyce died from the complications of a, an ulcer. Now, within a short few years, now you just don't see duodenal ulcers anymore. And stomach cancer is the one cancer that is actually plummeted. If you look at the graph of cancer, some of them are going up because of obesity and other things. Some of them are, pla are plateaued. But stomach cancer has gone way down. The reason for that is that Helicobacter was discovered and is being removed from the human stomach. So whereas when I came back to Ireland, maybe up to 40% of the population had Helicobacter in the stomach. There was a time when, in Victorian times, 100% of us had it. We know that from archival samples. But now it's only a minority of people have it. So... By it shows that science can actually make a difference because those diseases, well, they're not completely gone. They're almost historic. Now, would it be wonderful if we could do the same about colon cancer and some of the other cancers where we, we're not blaming a microbiome, we're just saying it, we could understand the microbiome decades before someone gets that condition so that we could do something early on. So preventive medicine, I think, is where... The microbiome, remember, I started by saying the microbiome is all about health. Mm. We evolved with a microbiome that is designed for health. We didn't evolve with a microbiome that's there to cause disease. It's there actually to keep you healthy. If we would stop abusing it and misusing it, then actually, I don't think we live forever. I don't want to live forever, but I want to have a good health span. Health span I want yeah. to be healthy while I'm growing old. And I can do that by doing something about my microbiome. That's one of the things. Another one that uh, um, excites me and dismays me at the same time is that uh, microbes on the planet, I mean, not long ago, we didn't know that microbes are in the air. They're everywhere. Um, change. And they're in, in the water we swim in. Mm. They're in the water we drink. And that's all good. We evolved with them. They're all good. But climate change is adversely affecting them. Now, if you think about it, and we mentioned this in the book, it was microbes, they were there before humans. Microbes made the planet habitable. It was microbes that developed the way to split water and create oxygen and, and shape our, our, um, our atmosphere. Microbes were what created plants eventually. Microbes are critical for the soil. Microbes are critical for the food we eat. Without the plants we eat, we wouldn't have animals. And so on and so on. We wouldn't have humans even. So I, I think that uh, at every level, when I look, it's not that I think micro, my, the microbiome is the solution for everything, but it's part of the solution for an awful lot of things. In fact, there's very few things I can think of where the microbiome doesn't have some role. I'm not a fanatic. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not one of these evangelists. I don't, um, I don't do anything to the extreme, but I like to sample everything. Mm. Uh, so I do believe in moderation of all th in all things, including moderation. Sample and live life. Um, but I do think there's an awful lot. If there's, I suppose if I have to say, if you maybe pick one thing, I think the one thing we can do is that we can influence the aging process. Not to live longer, but there's one thing we're all doing. Not everyone will get stomach cancer. Not everyone will get colon cancer. Not everyone wants a Mediterranean diet, but we will all age. We are all aging. But if you look left and look right, look at your classmates in school when you meet them. Or if you go to a parent-teacher meeting, and you look at them, you think, my God, do I look as old as they do? You know, look left, look right, and you'll see people that clearly look older than their chronological age. And you'll see other people that look, we say, they're so, they're well preserved. You see this everywhere. Now, usually in the old days, that was because one of them is smoking and the other one isn't smoking. 
you can tell smokers a mile off, they age faster. But in a non-smoking population, a big part of it is how healthy is their microbiome, which in turn is a reflection of how healthy are they eating. Um, but the microbiome alone has positive effects on the aging process. And that's clear. That's not my speculation. That is proven. We can find ways to improve foods. The food industry needs to step up to the plate and give us foods that uh, can favorably retain a healthy microbiome. Because I know, we know, that that is one of your best chances of improving your health span and um, at least slowing up the downward trajectory of frailty that we know of. So there would be, if somebody put the QR codes down and they could find information about, say, foods and companies yeah. and organizations. Sure. Okay. And when we talk about fiber, you know, that's a loose word we use. We all talk about high fiber diets, diverse fiber. But actually we get into what kind of fibers. Mm -hmm. You know, it isn't just enough to talk about one fiber. We need lots of different fibers. And that's what I meant that when you diversify your diet, you are in effect taking fibers of different types. But you don't have to become bamboozled by saying to yourself, oh, I must take Arabinus Island or I must take Inion or I must take this. You don't need to be bombarded by the science. You just need to diversify what you eat and eat whole food. And you will in effect food, yeah. let the science actually prove the mechanisms, but the fundamentals are, are there already. Yeah, terrific. Fergus, where can the book is called Listen to Your Microbes? Where can I'll put a link to it in the description box? Yeah. Well, you know, I didn't write the book for my career. I, I don't need this for my career, but it's my first foray. It's it's a it's an attempt to provide a public health message. And because the microbiome is so important for, for public health, I've actually been quite critical in an earlier book. I wrote a, a book called The Language of Illness, where I was very critical about public health messaging. I didn't think the messaging was very good. I thought the messaging about screening versus diagnosis was appallingly bad. I thought the messaging about vaccination was ineffectual. I thought the messaging about obesity was at times insulting to people who are overweight and ineffective. So this is an attempt to take one area and show how it might be done. And it has at minimal words, the emphasis is on imagery, so it's largely cartoons. There are humans in it, but they're in black and white. The microbes are in color. And the story is told not from the human's perspective. It's told from the microbe's perspective. So it is the microbes commenting on the misuse of the microbiome by humans. So they are commenting on what diet they'd like, what it means when they're exposed to a drug. Remember, they evolved to see drugs as toxins and to dismantle those toxins. So now when they see a drug in the modern era, what do you think they do? Well, in some cases, they inactivate some of those drugs. So it's a way of telling the story that is uh, beautiful to look at, easy to read. And if you want more detail, you go to the QR code. If you want a quick overview, you just read the text. And it's not overloaded. It's not dumbed down. It is, in my view, try and attempt to be simple, but not too simple. And that's important. It is not dumbed down. It uh, is for young people and not so young. It's for all ages. So it's Listen to Your Microbes. It's in all the shops. Uh, Dubray's, we had the book launch there uh, about a month ago. It's available from Liberty's Press, probably the least expensive way to get it. Um, is it but it's on in the usual audio, bookshops. Is there an audio book? To... Sorry. It, it will be on. I don't know if it's on audio yet, but it will Hello. be on audio. Yeah. Uh, but you can see the parts of it on the YouTube channel called Listen to Your Microbes as well. Listen to your microbes. Um, last question, Fergus. You mentioned the language of illness. You have a previous book that sounds fascinating as well. Um, and, in, and it sounds like how authorities are communicating. Can I just ask you out of curiosity on the vaccination, the COVID vaccination, what was the main message of, of what did they get wrong? Well, um, I think we got a lot that was right here in Ireland. And the Irish people are um, more open to science and they're well-educated, comparatively speaking. Could be better, but they're well-educated. But Irish people have a good sense of risk and benefit appraisal. They read the Broad Street newspapers and they're, they're not just totally consumed by social media. They do tune into the mainstream media. They listen to podcasts like yours. So in Ireland, we got it in many ways quite right. But in other countries, 
I think, um, I, and I don't want to be too critical, but there are some people you'll never convince. But I do think stories are far more effective than facts. You need a certain amount of facts, but just lecturing and hectoring people about the dangers of not taking a vaccine, particularly when it comes from people from big multinational vaccine companies and drug companies, that's not as effective as hearing about a human interest story where a child who was not vaccinated, say for measles, and we already know that measles vaccination has gone down, it's gone down to UK and elsewhere. But I've seen the the after effects of the infection measles in unvaccinated children. And it's horrendous for the young child. It causes it for most people who recover from it, but for a minority of children, vulnerable children, they develop severe long-standing brain injury. Sometimes it's fatal. Mm -hmm. That is a terrible thing, a terrible shame on us when we have something that we know prevents the long-term consequences of measles. And just for some misguidedness or for some basis of ignorance, we don't vaccinate our children. Now, some of that was, was, it comes from people uh, who are uneducated, are listen, disbelieving for good reasons, sometimes disbelieving big pharma. But you just have to hear some human interest stories to actually convince you. And I believe stories are far more effective than just facts alone. That would be one point I'd make about the vaccine, vaccine story. Brilliant. But I've been very critical about public health messaging about mm. obesity mm. and how, how people with, who are overweight and obese have been effectively stigmatized uh, for their illness. And the book deals in, there's lots of evidence to show that. And the messaging surrounding that in many countries have been an abject failure. Uh, so the kind of things you and I were talking about and how we could offset obesity by helping the microbiome, by by taking Mediterranean diets, etc. They're all pretty ineffective if we don't have the messaging right, and if people aren't getting the messages. But if they're being stigmatized and abused, then it's ineffective. When we came to screening and diagnosis, you, know, you remember there were controversies about screening in Ireland not too long ago, cervical screening and other forms of screening. But yet a lot of the cases that we were hearing about was a confusion. Basically, if you've got symptoms, you need a diagnosis. That's not screening. That's diagnosis. That's healthcare that needs to be in place to take care of someone who's already got the disease. Screening is about doing something in people who don't have symptoms and you want to pick up something early. And yet that was conflated and misconfused and misportrayed in the media. So we have to get the messaging. Messaging and language is terribly important. And that's partly what the book, uh, The Language of Illness, is about. But it's also about just one on that's public health messaging. The book is also about one on one doctors to patients. And some of the language being used actually, rather than connecting doctors with the patients, distances doctors from their patients. And it's compounded by, by because of the fact that doctors have less time now with their patients uh, to speak. But the whole thing creates these uh, this asymmetry between the doctor and the patient. And one is using one language. The patient is talking about illness. In other words, their lived experience. And sometimes they're angry. They may be depressed. Um, and they're suffering. Suffering is not a word that features much in medical textbooks. Doctors usually talk about disease. In other words, the objective evidence of something being wrong. Whereas patients talk about the experience, the lived experience of that disease. And they use different words. And doctors use an awful lot of language, not just jargon, but an awful lot of language that's totally unnecessary. So as a medical student, the average medical student, in the first year of medical school, they learn 10,000 new, new words, like rhinorrhea, which means a runny nose, or epistaxis, which means a bleeding nose. What's wrong with bleeding nose and runny nose? And yet when they come to final med, I have to actually get them to down-regulate those technical names, technical words, and speak in familiar terms. So when they enter medical school, they replace the familiar with the exotic. And then when they come to see patients, they have to relearn the whole thing to start learning how to speak properly to people, which is ordinary speak. It's daft, it's ridiculous, and it takes it's antiquated. And um, I've given numerous examples where it actually can lead to uh, bad medicine. 
when bad language is used. Yeah, I think every academy, every has its own vernacular, right? So even in the corporate world, when you move into the corporate world, um, American technology companies, you learn a vernacular and you pick True, it up. True, but it's vastly inflated in the case of medicine. And yeah. in the case of medicine, it's hugely unnecessary. And it's a legacy largely from 19th century medicine that not enough people have changed. As I said, a certain amount of jargon is necessary, but when it's necessary, the public cop on very quickly. Mm. I mean, people now know about PCR. Before COVID, nobody needed to know about PCR, therefore they didn't know about PCR. But when they did need to know about it, they cop on very quickly. They, they get it quite quickly. Mm. And they know about CT scans and MRI scans, but they don't have to know a lot of things like they don't need to know the silly Latin names for certain diseases. They don't need to know silly things like epistaxis or rhinorrhea. And you know something? The doctors don't need to know it either. Mm. Use ordinary, simple language. and We'd have far better communication and it would waste less time. Brilliant. Professor Ferguson, Janahan, thank you so much. Thank you, Connor. Bye-bye.